So before we get into talking about the chemistry of amines, let's talk just a little bit about their structure. So we have in an amine an sp3 hybridized nitrogen and as we just talked about in the last video that nitrogen is going to have three substituents uh, which could be uh, you know it could be hydrogen it could be an organic group or whatever um, and then that's going to leave one lone pair so there's there's four groups just like we would have with carbon okay so this is going to be an sp3 hybridized nitrogen okay which means then that that nitrogen is tetrahedral okay so each of these substituents and that lone pair needs a space to go to uh, and so that the the you know the the uh, geometry to give each of those things the most possible space is tetrahedral so it's just like carbon except that there isn't one there's one of those substituents is a pair of electrons okay now, just as with uh, carbon, um, with four substituents, if those four substituents are different, they, it can actually be chiral, right? So with, with an, uh, an amine, we could actually draw um, a, a, a nitrogen that wouldn't be superimposable on its mirror image, okay? So let's just do this very generically. Um, so I'll just use X, Y, and Z right just to just to stand for some generic substituents so if x y and z are all different substituents um, and then that lone pair is obviously different um, then that's four different substituents and so that's chiral so this wouldn't be um, superimposable on its mirror image the same way that a chiral center on carbon uh, wouldn't be the problem is though that this lone pair actually has a pretty low barrier to inversion so it can basically just pop through and the whole thing can invert so the amine can kind of you know flip up and down like a little umbrella and so uh we can sort of draw it this way if you imagine that lone pair just kind of kind of slipping through um and, and coming out the other side and then what that's going to give you is um, a complete inversion of of that uh, center. So even if this thing was chiral um, and you had a single uh, enantiomer of it, a single mirror image, um, it, it's just going to be able to uh, invert itself and then th that gives the enantiomer. So for the most part, um, amines are, uh, they can be chiral, but they are not going to be resolvable, which means that you're not going to be able to get out a single enantiomer. Now there is an exception to that rule. Uh, if you have something structurally that would prevent that uh, inversion from happening, um, then you can actually have a chiral amine. So we'll just draw one one example. So if you if you have the substituents tied up in a in two two rings like this, so a bicyclic amine, and then just put some sub substituents on these uh, arms here uh, that make each of them different. Well, well now we've got a situation where indeed we do have a chiral nitrogen center and we have one, two, three, four different substituents. And this, this has no ability to invert. It would be geometrically impossible for that nitrogen to, to invert. Um, and so this actually is um, a, a chiral amine, a, a chiral at the nitrogen amine, um, and it can be resolved, meaning that it can't interconvert with its mirror image. Um, so obviously in complex amines, this is going to be uh, a reasonable possibility um, with, with normal, um, you know, simple amines, uh, you're, you're not going to expect the nitrogen to be chiral. There is one uh, other circumstance though, where nitrogen can absolutely be chiral and stable in that form. And that's if we um, were to convert the nitrogen into a, a, a species where it has four substituents. So if we react this with an alkylating agent or with a proton, um, we actually create another bond. Um, that's going to make a, a charged nitrogen, but it, that is actually going to prevent um, that, uh, that inversion. It's just no longer going to be possible um, like you would have uh, with, with an amine. It's actually going to be a lot more like the carbon situation. Okay, so I'll just, just show one example here uh, where just, just randomly picking four substituents but by virtue of the fact that this nitrogen has four substituents, that means it's, it's charged. And so this is now called an ammonium ion. Okay, so amine goes positive, it's an ammonium ion. 
and this doesn't have the ability to invert okay so there's there's no more lone pair to invert and so ammoniums can be chiral and they could be resolved as well all right okay so that's just a, a little bit about the the uh the chirality and the structure of amines um we should also point out that uh just like alcohols um amines can engage in hydrogen bonding Okay, so uh, we might just sort of represent this quickly. Um, so if we have you know, at least one NH, um, that can that can certainly um, engage in in hydrogen bonding. So the the lone pair from one amine is going to uh, form a non-covalent interaction with the the NH bond of another amine, right? So that's a that's a hydrogen bond. And then you know if you've got a a concentrated solution of of the amine, then then you can have sort of these chains, you know, very much like water um, uh, that or or alcohols uh, like we talked about. Um, but the hydrogen bonding uh, in amines is is uh, usually going to be a little bit less effective here. So um, remember we uh, we talked about this when we uh, talked about the hydrogen bonding in alcohols, and what we did there was to compare the boiling points of um, of a hydrocarbon and of water. So if we just compare the boiling point of methane, that's 161.6 degrees Celsius, um, and the molecular weight of, of methane is 16. Uh, and then we compare that to, to water. So you could think about water as being the oxygen, uh, the oxygen analog of methane. Okay, so there's just two hydrogens. So the boiling point of water is, as you know, 100 degrees Celsius. And the molecular weight is 18. So uh, uh, water is only two units higher than methane, but you can see that its boiling point is 260 degrees higher, and that's due exclusively to that hydrogen bonding potential. So now we can actually put the nitrogen derivative in here. So ammonia, um, and keep in mind here that the molecular weight of ammonia is going to be right in between, so 17. So they're all in the same ballpark. And where do we expect the the boiling point of ammonia to be? Well, it's not going to be like methane because methane can't hydrogen bond at all. Um, but it turns out it's not going to be as, as high as water because it's not quite as good. Um, it turns out the boiling point of ammonia is about um, minus 33.3. Okay, so it's obviously way less than water, but it's significantly more than methane. Okay, and that's even in fact, uh, that's, that's uh, in spite of the fact that uh, ammonia has three NH bonds that can hydrogen bond whereas oxygen only has two, um, uh, but uh, the water has a much higher boiling point, okay? All right, so uh, much, or probably even all of the, the important chemistry of amines has to do with the fact that uh, it does have this, this free lone pair, okay? And, and as I said in the previous lecture, um, that lone pair is relatively um, weakly bound to the nucleus, at least in comparison to oxygen um, and and uh, and fluorine. Okay, so uh, nitrogen is relatively um, you know less electronegative, and so that means that this lone pair is capable of of interacting with either hydrogen or or electrophiles for that matter, uh, other electrophiles. Okay, um, and so if it's the proton, then we're just simply going to protonate the amine, and we'll go to the ammonium as we just talked about. Okay, so the ammonium salt. Um, and so in terms of thinking about basicity, okay, we, we could think about a, a relative trend. So um, we've, got, we've got oxygen with its two lone pairs is, is significantly less basic than um, an amine with just one lone pair. Um, and we, would, we could compare this to, to carbon, right? So the comparison with carbon would have to be where there's still a lone pair um, on the carbon. Uh, this, of course, makes it make, makes it an, an anion, um, and so uh, carbon is is you know by far the most basic here. But um, an amine is is reasonably basic too, whereas uh, we don't usually think of oxygens as being uh, all that basic uh, at all. And uh, the best way to sort of think about this is in terms of pKa's, and so we could look at um, protonated methanol, right? So this is going to be a an oxocarbenium ion. 
the pKa of protonated methanol is negative 2.2 and the pKa, so the analogous methylamine, uh, which is an ammonium ion, the pKa there is actually 10.6, right? So this, that's a massive difference. Uh, uh, methylamine, is, that means that it's a trillion times more basic than the alcohol, um, which is a reasonably big effect. Um, so we have basicity, and then of course we have nucleophilicity, okay, or Lewis basicity if you like. Nucleophilic, and this is this is sort of the way that we're going to talk about amines um, in large part. So if we have you know that lone pair, we can think about um, then having a, an electrophile, uh, and that type of of reaction is going to occur. Okay, so. In either of those cases, we're going to, at least as an intermediate, if not a final product, we're going to get to um, a quaternary ammonium salt um, where there's, there's four different substituents there. Okay. All right. Um, so let's talk just a little bit more about, about the basicity of these nitrogen lone pairs, um, because as we've seen before, way back into the uh, aromaticity section, um, if the, the lone pair of the, of the nitrogen is tied up, um, whether that's in, um, in aromaticity or in a, in a resonance form uh, of, with some other functional group, that's going to very much reduce its, its ability to act as a base. Right? So um, I'll just remind you uh, when we talked about pyridine. Remember pyridine, right? And so pyridine is a, is a situation where um, you've got uh, one, one uh, um, p, uh, p orbital from every atom, um, one electron from each atom, uh, giving you six pi electrons for the aromaticity. And that leaves that lone pair on nitrogen um, available to, to serve as a base. So pyridine is basic. And then you'll remember in contrast when we talked about parole, that in this case, that lone pair on the parole is actually necessary to complete that uh, six pi aromatic system. And so that means that parole is not basic. Okay, so that's that's a bit of review from, from back then. Um, but, but basically what that means is that if the lone pair is tied up, then it's not gonna be available as a base. And the other one that we talked about was in terms of amides. So when we've got We've got this type of situation. Remember that there's this very important resonance form of an amide where the, that lone pair is, is uh, in conjugation with the carbonyl. So we have this resonance form. And so what that means here again is that that nitrogen is also not basic, okay? So you can sort of predict whether an amine is going to be basic or not um, based on whether its lone pair is uh, tied up in, in resonance, okay? Um, and then we can also uh, think about the, the actual basicity um, of, of an amine um, by evaluating how much it's going to be donating into a, uh, in, into a, a pi system, right? So if we looked at uh, amino substituted benzenes, which are called anilines, um, what we could do is we could, we could look at um, the, the equilibrium um, of protonation for those aniline derivatives okay so we will look at this equilibrium where we're just seeing uh, to what extent that aniline will be protonated um, and then what we can do is we can change this substituent and see how it impacts the pKa of the nitrogen um, and you'll recall of course that there is there can be communication between the substituents on an aromatic ring so we can just look quickly and see um, how this impacts things as we change the X group so we can go from uh, strongly electron donating substituents like amine groups or oxygens um, down to alkyl groups. Um, we'll always use proton as our, as our sort of standard. And then we can look at mildly electron withdrawing groups like the halogens. And then we can go to very strongly electron withdrawing groups like cyano groups and nitro. And then we can look at how, um, we can look at how these groups are going to impact the pKa. So our standard is with the proton, okay? So that pK of aniline itself is 4.63. Um, and what would you predict would happen as we put on electron donating groups? So you might wanna pause the video at this point to see if you can predict 
what's going to happen to the pKa as we add uh, increasingly strongly electron donating groups, and then also ask obviously the opposite question: what's going to happen to the pKa as we make these groups increasingly electron withdrawing? Okay. All right. So what's going to happen, of course, is um, that right. So if you think about what what is uh, what makes a, a good base. Well, a good base is something that wants to donate its electron density to the proton, right? So if we're adding more electron density to this nitrogen, we're going to make it more basic, which means that the pKa of the conjugate acid is going to go up, right? It's higher pKa means it's a worse acid. Um, and so as we add electron donating groups, we're going to increase the pKa. So if we add a methyl group, it goes up to 5.08. If we add an oxygen 5.34 and all the way up to the amino group and we get to 6.15 okay so by the same token if we start to withdraw electron density right from this we're going to make this into a stronger acid it's going to be more willing to give up its uh, proton and so as we start to add electron withdrawing groups we um, start to acidify um, these ammoniums over here and you can uh, see that this actually starts to go down really quite far to the point where when, if you've got paranitroaniline, uh, you've, got, you've got this uh, conjugate acid that has a pKa of one, which actually makes it a very strong uh, acid indeed. Okay, all right, so that's a little bit about the, the uh, lone pair of, of amines and how it's, uh, it can be affected by its uh, substitution patterns. Um, and so what we're going to move on to next is talking about how we actually synthesize amines.